Okay. So we now begin stochastic control. And we have two chapters on stochastic control. The next one has differential games, but that also has a stochastic part of the differential games. But it, because that is a game chapter, it has both deterministic and stochastic games, okay? Um, in all, all time I had separate deterministic game and separate stochastic games. I put them together as one chapter. <clears throat> so until chapter 12, we have a single agent problem. and chapter 13, we have multi-agent problems. So that means games, okay? The stochastic control begins in chapter 12 and continues until chapter 13. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that, well, let's, let's go to the next slide. I don't, oh yeah, here we go. So what happens is that the state variable of the system in, in, until last chapter was known with certainty. Now what happens is that these variables can be outcome of a random phenomena. So there may be underlying process that perturbs this state. And so the state then becomes a stochastic process. So you have XT, now XT becomes a stochastic process, okay? And it is a stochastic process that is defined by the state equation. So there's a stochastic differential equation, just like a differential equation gives you the state over time. The stochastic differential equation gives you the stochastic process over time. Now, <clears throat> the perturbation processes can be another stochastic process, which is a, a, a underlying process. And theoretically, it can be any general process, but the theory of stochastic differential equation is not developed so that we can handle any kind of such perturbations. The most amount of work is done when this underlying process is Brownian motion or Wiener process. This is the simplest of the processes that uh, comes in play and, uh, and it will then give you a stochastic differential equation, which when you have a Brownian motion, then it's also called an Ito differential equation. It's uh, by name Ito was a Japanese uh, researcher who, who, who played a big role in this particular aspect. But you can also have uh, processes that are developed by Poisson processes, and then, then, then you can also have those, but we will not be doing those. We will be only doing processes that are perturbed by a Brownian motion. We're not going to do much about the Weiner motion. You have uh, Appendix D.2. Uh, please uh, read it uh, and, and get as much out of it as you 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 you, you can. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Ben Susan will teach a course in 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 I think the next semester, and he will cover stochastic control in more detail but he will also cover Brownian motion as part of that course. Because you start with the Brownian motion, then you go to the Ito equation, then you go to stochastic control. That's kind of the procedure. Ours, uh, we're just gonna go more like a recipe, <clears throat> how you treat the problem. And for that particular um, way to do this, we don't need to know too much about the Brownian motion and it's 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 mathematics, which is which is not which is not simple. Brownian motion is the simplest stochastic process, but its mathematics is again not so simple. Uh, but the way we will treat it is it 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 is more like a recipe, and that recipe is simple. Okay. So um, we assume that the state will be fully observed. That means the stochastic process as it unfolds, we will know exactly what it is. If it's an inventory that is developing over time, we will know the inventory at time t. 
but we will not do the inventory at time t at time zero. At time zero, we only know what it will be and what kind of distribution it will have. And that distribution will depend on all the control that goes from zero to t because the control also affects the, 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 the development, the, 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 um, the progress or the evolution of the process. And if on the other hand, the states are not fully observed, we call them partially observed control problems. And they are actually even more difficult. And um, there are references to that. Um, a huge amount of work on partially observed control problem as it applies to inventory problems was done by our group. I mean, our group may have done 95% of the work on uh, inventory models when it comes to partially observed problems. Um, some of it is in journals and all that, and it is still going on. In fact, uh, um, we have two or three papers right now on that topic with uh, PhD students in mathematics. Me and Ben Susan have those papers, and we are currently uh, in the process of submitting those papers. But anyway, those are not within the scope of this course. And I have a feeling that maybe Alain will cover them uh, in that other course. Now, when you come to stochastic control problems, we're going to basically change the XT to capital X just to make a difference between just call it a random variable process, you know, kind of thing. So they, we just do that. Um, but books, not every book does that. And some people will just keep it a small x. So that's to just tell you what's going on. In this particular book, I want to make the x to be capital when it is random variable and u, which is the control, also to be capital when, because it's going to depend on another random variable, which is xt. When if ut depends on xt, then since xt is stochastic, the ut as a function of another stochastic process will also be a stochastic process. So here's the way we express a stochastic differential equation. If you look at it, if you divide by dt, so this is the same f that we have before. This is the same g that we have before. I just made them, here I made this capital. But if you divide this whole thing by dt, then this becomes dxt dt, just like our x dot. This dt cancels out, so we have an f x ut. So this is our original equation when you divide by dt. Now we add something, but if you divide by dt, this Brownian motion zt is a Brownian motion that is not differentiable. And so dzt by dt actually doesn't make that much sense. However, it is a notation for what is called the what is called the white noise. The white noise is a terminology in electrical engineering, which is a, again, it's the same thing in some sense, but it is almost like this dt by dt. So, so in all literature in electrical engineering, you will see that this will be divided by dt. This will not have a dt, and this will be this dt dt will be a, a a WT DT. So DZT will be a WT DT and it'll be just WT. The WT is a, the, 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 the byte process. <clears throat> but because it's not, this is the, this is now the more way, this is the way to read it. We write differential equations in this case. And the differential equation makes only sense in terms of how you can integrate them. So so if you, if you want to integrate and find xt, then you have to know how to integrate this guy, and you have to have to integrate how to integrate this guy, right? So if you, let's say if I want to integrate from zero to small t to find out what is x of small t, uh, then I would integrate this. So that would be xt minus x0. Uh, x0 is already here. And I will have the integral of this, which is standard because it is, it is, it is, the old integral, if you want to think about it. That one is not standard. And this integral is called stochastic integral. And we need to know how you get that. 
And as long as you know how to get that, then we can continue. Uh, uh, at least the differential equation theory then works, and then we have a, a, a proper state, and we can have a control problem. Having said that, there is a maximum principle. It's called a stochastic maximum principle. There are two reasons why we are not covering that. One reason is that it is mathematically a lot more complicated in the sense that it requires an advanced level of mathematics that most of you may not have done. The second part is that it is not that useful in the sense that most of the literature in stochastic control goes via dynamic programming. And we will see what, what is it called in, 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 in stochastic control literature, but it's essentially dynamic programming. And it allows you to get what is called the feedback control, which means the control as a function of the state. Axiom principle, on the other hand, doesn't give you a feedback control. It gives you open loop control, which means it gives you a control over time, but you know all of that control at time zero. So it's open loop in the sense it doesn't react to the state at each given time t. So it is it is essentially not a topic that you you learn in a in a in a regular control theory course. But of course, you can have courses on stochastic maximum principle in the math department. So we will we will go through what is called the so we're going to go back all the way to chapter two, where we derive the dynamic programming equation, and from dynamic programming equation, we derive the maximum principle. But here we will derive dynamic programming equation, but we will not derive the maximum principle. We will stop at dynamic programming equation, but we will derive it in a stochastic setting, okay? This is a standard thing that we did before. Uh, we assume that these functions f and s and these are these are all uh, <clears throat> first of all we're going to assume they be scalar that means that for this particular chapter we will not do vector <clears throat> but all of that just like in the determinacy case you can actually do a vector notation and everything will go through but since we are only doing a little bit of it and are all the examples that we will do, all the application we will do are actually all single scalar kind of uh, processes. So we will not, we will not actually even bother to, 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 to tell you, you know, what you have to do to, to make it uh, multidimensional, okay? But the theory is available and, and you can take any book on stochastic control and you will see that. Once again, F and G are continuously differential in their arguments. And for multidimensional extension, you can, you know, my reference is going to be Fleming and Richel. That, that was one of the uh, standard book in the literature. Uh, Fleming has to be, uh, happens to be my co-author um, on uh, a number of papers, um, one or two papers maybe. Um, you know, I also sp spent one semester at Brown University as a, as a professor of uh, visiting professor of mathematics uh, and, and wrote some papers with Fleming and I also got to know Michelle at the time. Um, so I, I know both those guys quite well. Um, <clears throat> okay. We will write XT, UT, ZT instead of write XT, UT because if you write these guys, there'll be just too many parentheses all over the place. So we will, we will this is exactly means this. X sub t means exactly x sub t, okay? So that's a little bit of a notation and, and some limitation of that we will even not bother to do multidimensional, although everything we do has a multidimensional counterpart. So now, <clears throat> hark back to chapter two. And what we did in chapter two is this. We took V of x t, there was a picture there, and then we took maximum over u, and, but now we have an expected value that wasn't there before because our, our processes are, uh, so we begin at time t and at a value x. 
So at time t, the stochastic process xt is already observed, and we will call this small x. The small x is the beginning value at time t. And remember, uh, since we're going to do feedback, uh, whether we, we begin at time t and time zero, it's okay. So, so most people would begin at time t because that's a general setting. And then, on, and then for, but it also works for t equal to zero. Okay. And then just like before, we had x plus dx, but now of course we will have x plus dxt, but dxt is now the solution you know, that the dxt would be exactly given by this equation 12.2. And there will be an extra term here, which was not there before. And we will, that's the big difference. And that big difference is a $64 difference here. So we have a x plus dxt and t plus dt. So what's the difference between this and equation in chapter two? Well, there is, a, there is, a, there is first of all, we deal with the u is capital because u will be a function of a stochastic process. x is given at this time t. So we just call it as little x. And we have a, this dxt, which is going to be, uh, again, different than small dxt that we had in chapter two. And then we do Taylor's expansion. Just like we did in chapter two, we do Taylor's expansion. So we have a Taylor's expansion of Vx plus dxt plus t plus dt. So you're going to do the Taylor's expansion of this term. Well, this term will give you first is right away, this one. And then the first order term will be V sub t dt, V sub x dx, and half V sub x dx squared. That's exactly the same as before. What is different, however, is that we are now going to take a second order term. And the reason we take a second order term is that in the chapter two, the second order term disappeared. It was a smaller order. It was the order of smaller than dt. Uh, so dt, so so we did not have to go through. So we so we we, we lumped everything second order included as a higher order terms because they all disappear when we divide by dt and take the limit, okay? But what happens in stochastic control is that they, they don't disappear. And the reason they don't disappear is because the process is of unbounded variation and it is, its, it's derivative is not that small, even though it doesn't exist, but it fluctuates a lot. So it's expected value of that is not that small, okay? And that's the big difference. So we're gonna take the second order term and we will carry them there, okay? So, so mind out, from chapter two, these terms are different, okay? Continue on. Just like in chapter two, we're gonna now do this. We have a dxt square, but now we have a, a in all time, it will just f squared dt square because there was only one term on the right hand side. But now there are two terms on the right hand side. You see, if you go there, yeah, one and this. So when you take it square of that, you get a square of that, square of that, and two times the multiplier of that. Okay, so we get all of three things. So we get three terms. So when we do that, we get this term like in chapter two. Then we get a term like this, and we take the, this multiplier term. Okay, so this is the square. And because we also have a dxt dt term here, um, Shall is that? Let me see. Where is this? You are. Oh yeah. So you have a dxt dt. Yeah, we have a dxt dt here, and so we need to also take that. So dxt dt is. We have to multiply by dxt. So dxt get a dt square term, and we get this term. Now, if you learn Brownian motion you will see that there is something called stochastic calculus. And what is important for us is basically a multiplication rule of the dx dt terms. Okay, that's, those are the ones that we need to know. Turns out that the dzt square, that term here, is of the order of dt. So we keep it. That's the difference. All these others, this is this was already of the of the small order. This was a small ODT. 
this will also be small ODT. So although this is big, it's not that big. Okay. But that one is big. Okay. So these guys are small orders, so they disappear, but that one remains. So by taking the Taylor series expansion, by doing this, which is standard, and by applying this, 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 these rules of stochastic calculus, we get this equation. So again, let's compare this equation with chapter two equation. We have this term in chapter two, 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 we have this term in chapter two. And we have this term in chapter two. That one, we don't. So what we did was we took the dzt squared because part of that will be dzt squared, which will come here. We change that to dt and we, we have a g squared dt. And remember there was a vxx term here, right there. So we have a half vxs dzt squared that becomes dt. So we get this term. Now notice if we divide by dt and multiply, but of course this v and v cancel out just like before. So we remove that and then there was a zero here and right hand side will be without v. Then we divide by dt. When you divide by dt and take a limit, this goes to zero. But that one stays. Because dt and dt cancel out and it will be this. So what we took is when we do that, cancel v on both sides, let dt go to zero, we get this. So what do we have? If you compare to chapter two, up to that, from there to there is the same. But this is different. And then boundary condition is the same. So let's take our stock. We did nothing except we did almost same as chapter two, except with the recognition that the Taylor series have to be done. We have to keep the second order term. Of the second order term, one term survives. And that term is this. So, so the between chapter two, these equations in chapter two and here, the only difference is this term. And remember, that's a dynamic programming equation. And the idea was to solve for value function. So if we, if we didn't go further and do maximum principle, we will then have the equation and Notice when you maximize this equation and write the write the u optimal u within this system because there's a, there's an op optimal u as a function of f, and if you include that, then you can remove the max. And when you remove the max, we call it Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. We will do the same thing. This is also called the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. So the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. It's an equation in continuous time dynamic programming when the system is subject to a differential equation. Okay, so it's called Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. But generally we, we can call it dynamic programming, but people people will refer to that equation, Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. Okay. So so, so while the max is still there, it's a Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. When the max is removed, we remove Bellman. We call it Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on. But, but you will, the, that terminology is flexible. You can also keep calling it a JB equation. It's not a big deal. Okay, so we have this equation. <clears throat> we also write current value version of this, okay? Because we will be using current value version as well. And so we put a e to the minus rho t, but when we do the current value version, there's no point making this, this phi also depend on t. So what we do is f depends on t only through discount rate, s depends on t only through this discount rate. If these guys depend on t, also, like if the phi depends on t, then there is no point taking the current value version. The current value version doesn't help at all. 
So you might as well just do the present value version. OK, so current value version, we have to remove the T here. So these are stationary functions and only dependence on on small t is coming through a discounting rate. And here I change it. Uh, there we did a different way of deriving the current value. Here I'm going to derive the current value in a more uh, different way, but it's another way. It's, it's, it's a simpler way, but it's another way. It, it, sometimes you learn something from one and you learn something else from the other, okay? We already learned the other way, so we're going to do it this way. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the current value value function to be because this is not current value. This is a, this the present. This the, so the current value version would be because that's the present value version. So to bring it to time t, we have to multiply by e to e to the rho t. Okay. So remember this is multiplied by e to the rho t. Not we're not taking discount because the dis, discount of this is this guy. This is the present value. So we can discount this guy. So we can put e to the minus rho t on this side and remove the e rho t on this side. Then we have a present value to be e to the minus rho t of the current value. Okay. So right now we are going for the present value, the current value. We are going to do it this way. Then we take the derivative of this v tilde. So we take a derivative of v tilde or whatever. We, we take the derivative of v. It doesn't matter which way you go. We get these equations. You get v tilde t this, v, v x equal to this, v x equal to this. It's a straightforward taking derivative with respect to t. And then substituting that in the hamilton jacobi Bellman equation. So we've done the substitution. OK. But when we do the substitution, there's a v term here. And there's a v term here. And we want this whole equation in v tilde because we want current value version, right? So we already know we already know the value of v in terms of v tilde v. We, 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 we can we can we, we can already find out this from here. So for v tilde x, we can put v x v x x, we can put v tilde x e to the minus rho t. So we're gonna do that. When we do all of that, we get this. So you see, just like before, this this equation is very similar. The right hand side is very similar to this right hand side. What comes on this side is not zero anymore, and that is the only difference in the current value and the present value in a, in 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 a, in a previous way. It is the same here. So what we get instead of zero, we get rho times v tilde. So this equation, not zero here, but rho v tilde, becomes the hamilton jacobi bellman equation of the current value formulation. And v tilde x is now psi x. Because it is, it is current value. It is at that time. So I don't need to discount that at time t because I'm at t. That means I'm at capital T. So I'm at a capital T, whatever the value is, salvage value, I take it at that time. The meaning uh, oh, 12.2 and 12.11. Let's see where 12.11. Oh, this is 12.11. So in a, in, a, in what we are now trying to say is that when you have an infinite horizon function, we don't have this guy. We don't have a salvage value, and even if you did have a salvage value, it will be, it will be, it will go to zero as t. This t goes to infinity in some way as long as the salvage value doesn't. Okay, so whatever the salvage you give at that time will disappear. And we have for the infinite problem, we will have a psi equal to zero, and so we have this kind of equation for the infinite problem. And for continuous time. Of course, v tilde t will be zero because v tilde t now is not going to survive because the future at, at t is the same as the future at another, in the another t. So if I begin with the t, same future. If I begin another t, the same future. Okay, given initial condition to be the same, it will be the same future. No difference. So that means that the value function doesn't doesn't depend on 
small t, it only depends on x. So v, v, tilde, t, v tilde t will be zero, and v tilde t can be put zero. So we have a, for our, for our v tilde t, this becomes zero. So we just, that was also, in, it was also true in chapter four, when we, chapter three or four, wherever we did the current value formulation, this goes to zero. So infinite rise in Hamilton's Jacobi equation is this equation. So we have 12.19 for infinite horizon, current value version, and we have this equation for present value formulation. So those are the two equations that this, so this, 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 this discussion so far has yielded these two equations. And now if you have a current value version, we use the, the other two. We have a present value version, we use these two, okay? And then our purpose is to find the value function. Okay, so that's that's the task we want to do, and we're going to go through several examples. Uh, we're going through several examples uh, to to illustrate that the value of this formulation that we have. Now notice that given given that we are only now interested in solving this differential equation or the other differential equation in a finite horizon case, you notice that this equation doesn't have any stochastic. It's just a value function, right? It's an expected value of some right hand side as we defined. It is from T to infinity of the right hand side along an optimal path. So, so this the objective function to be integrated from T to infinity so once so to obtain the value function, all we need to do is to solve a, a differential equation or a partial differential equation. And that theory is totally deterministic. So what we did was we derived a differential equation for the value function, which is the value function, which is the expected value itself. So it, it is not stochastic, right? And the theory of solving is the same as the theory of solving in our deterministic setting because it is this, it is a similar looking equation. But what I'm trying to say is that's partly accomplished by because we use the stochastic calculus and all of that stuff. And <clears throat> excuse me. So we don't have to learn too much about Brownian motion in order to apply this theory to a few problems, okay? Um, so this is what I call a recipe. We're using these four equations, depending on finite versus infinite horizon, we're using them as a recipe to solve the problems. And most people in finance and in operations, when they use this, that's what they do. Because most of them do not have the deeper mathematical knowledge of this theory okay. used as a recipe. So if you're a great cook or great mathematician, you don't need a recipe. You, you, you invent the recipe or you do whatever you want. You, people like me or you, we go into a cookbook, look at the recipe and, and cook the dish. This is what we mean by the recipe. So we have a recipe, we're gonna use recipe to do the dishes. The dishes will be our applications. <clears throat> I don't want to say one more thing. I want to say one more thing is that when you have a infinite horizon function, we are left without this guy. We don't have a boundary condition. And we need one. And so the boundary condition in horizon, if somebody were to be able to give you a boundary condition at initial time, that would be great, but we don't have that. The terminal time boundary condition cannot be a boundary condition at infinity in a regular sense. So what we have is something called a growth condition. We need one condition so that the differential equation has an anchor, has a solution. So we call it a growth condition. And the growth condition you need to derive those things if you were to develop that theory. But generally speaking, it depends on the nature of the function phi xu, which is in the 
objective function, which is which is phi because remember f is phi times e to the e to the minus rho t. So phi, if the phi, so so the growth condition takes the takes its kind of it takes the condition from this condition of this guy. So if this is quadratic, then we say the value function we to be quadratic growth. And and so we cannot take any value function that are not quadratic growth. And that particular thing is acts like a boundary condition. So growth condition acts like a boundary condition and the growth condition in, in most cases similar to the growth condition on the function phi in the objective function. So in our case, it will be just linear or 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 quadratic because those are only the problems we are dealing with. And so we don't want to get too much into detail on this other than just telling you what it is. So now we go back to chapter six. And we did a stochastic prediction planning model which was developed by Thompson's uh, by Thompson and and Sethi. Thompson Sethi model was discussed in chapter six. And there it was a, a, what is called a linear quadratic problem. And we made a simple assumption in the beginning of the chapter six that we will not allow. There was something called the production could be negative. And the production could be negative only if the inventory in the beginning is too high. And we basically assume that the inventory in the beginning is not that high. So we don't have to worry about. Production going negative. Because we don't allow production to be negative, we have to put a condition on production becoming bigger than or equal to zero. But if bigger than or equal to zero condition is active, then we have to we need to worry about it. And we did that at the later part of the chapter six. But if it is not active, then we don't have to worry about it. And here we will make the assumption that the initial inventory is not that large, and so we don't have to worry about it. Because we don't want to look into when you put the production constraint P bigger than equal to zero and that constraint becomes active. That means sometimes the production will be zero as a result of that. Um, so in chapter six, I did P bigger than equal to zero and I solved the problem. For this problem, um, I Production bigger than equal to zero problem is more complicated. So, in early late seventies, maybe early eighties, I invited Professor Ben Susan to University of Toronto to visit me, and we looked at this problem for p bigger than equal to zero. And we looked at that problem, and Ben Susan and I, and another mathematician in the Toronto's math department, and another OR guy at uh, University of Waterloo. Four people were able to write a paper that solved this problem when p bigger than equal to zero is a constraint. It also needed, there's no close form solution, so we also needed some person to program it and you know I never program a single thing in my life other than learn some Fortran and basic course and did some little program for the course, but never really did programming for a research paper myself. So it has to be somebody else who did it. And one of the guy who did it was the math professor from from the University of Toronto. And that paper has appeared in Siam Journal of Control and Optimization. And I'm not going to cover it, but I'm just telling you that what I did in chapter six towards the end, I did not do it here because it, it is another chapter all by itself. And so it is left to the paper and it's sitting there for you to read if you want to read it. Uh, but if we use the Hamilton Jacobi theory, but it just does a lot of work to, to get there. Okay. So <clears throat> IT is the inventory level at time T, PT is production rate, S is the constant demand rate. Now I'm going to simplify myself here. 
There we try to have S, this is uh, time dependent, and we try to develop some turnpike theory. We're not gonna do all that. We're just gonna now, the purpose of this chapter is to introduce the stochastic control, give you the hamilton jacobi bellman equation and apply it to three or four problems to, to, to do that. That's basically the purpose of this. Just give you, just dip your toes with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, stochastic control uh, with minimal effort, and then go into the games, you know, next week. Okay, so I0 is the initial inventory level, B is the salvage value per unit time T, ZT is the standard Wiener process, sigma is the diffusion coefficient. So we have this equation. So we have this extra term that was not there in previous chapter, like in chapter six, we didn't have it, but now we have it. One could think of this as a spoilage rate, but spoilage rate only goes one way. Brownian motion doesn't have the direct, it can go both ways. It can go be positive or negative, right? Its mean is it's standard, Brownian, standard Brownian motion, the mean is zero. So it can go up and down. And it can go as far up and as far down as you want, in the sense that if you give long enough time, so the Brownian motion is in some sense quite interesting because if you take a Brownian motion, you give long enough time. Suppose you take a suppose you take an upper bound, let's say call it M, let's say it's 10,000. Okay. If you give long enough time, Brownian motion will cross that. If you give million, if you take long enough time, Brownian motion will cross that. But the probability is very low higher that thing, probability is very low because Brownian motion goes like this. We'll see some, some pictures later. Same thing below. It can go all the way down, whatever your bound is, you'll cross that bound. And if you get infinite over time, it will cross that bound infinitely many times. But very rarely, but, but given the infinity, it will, it will cross that line infinitely many times. So those are some of the, thought experiments that you might want to call uh, with the Brownian motions. It is an interesting character all by itself. Okay, and I, I gave you already the brown, uh, white noise thing. This is the white noise thing. So you can write DZT as WT DT. That's a formal writing. See, by, by formal writing, I mean that the writing is formal, but everybody understand the operation that goes with it. So as long as I know how to how to integrate this guy, WT DT, or as long as I know how to integrate this DZT, then I'm done because all I that's all I need. So I can write it whichever way. I can write it. So that's kind of a formal writing, but it, its meaning is there in terms of its integration. As long as you know how to integrate, you can solve the problem. The writing is writing just means that in some sense. Just like before, there was a goal level there, but I'm going to remove the goal level and make it zero. Zero is our goal here because just don't want too many parameters fooling around here, floating around here. And there's a there's a salvage value, no discounting. We did the same thing there as well, uh, so we have this. Again, we are assuming that oh. One could argue that negative values could be sales returns. That means you sell something, but the person wants to return it. So you have a negative sale. But it is not, how do I call it? It will be a difficult sell, difficult to convince people that that's what it represents. So you will see that inventory modeling you don't, you hardly ever see this kind of, you'll see this, of course, you know, give long enough time that people will want to write these papers, but we don't really, if you look at the whole inventory theory literature that you will learn in business school, generally speaking, you will learn, you will not learn this kind of, this kind of equation because we, we don't, it doesn't make that much sense to use that in an inventory setting. What makes sense is Poisson process, and those things you can get, those things you can learn, um, but but we are not we are not doing process process 
perturbations in this in this class. Okay, we're gonna assume we're gonna say we permit disposal. So to deal with that nasty max zero thing condition in chapter chapter six, we have two ways to do it. One is we allow less than zero production, whatever it is meaning, then mathematics goes through, or we find that the inventory is long enough and we will never get there. We will never, never, never get there. Okay. But <clears throat> Let's just make it simple for our purposes. We just assume that we will allow this and it just won't happen. Given very high level of inventory. OK. So now we have the two equations that we derived earlier for the finite horizon case and these equations we for this for our model are like this. So we have a Inti inti integral into terms under the integrand, then we have V sub T, then we have a differential equation part, which is multiplied by V sub X. So you see the part of the differential equation, which is the deterministic part, is multiplied by V sub X. And the stochastic part is, is sigma. You see sigma is the stochastic part here. And that's multiplied, the square of that is multiplied by V excess. So, this extra term is coming through that extra term sigma here. In chapter six, we did not have this. And that term here comes because of that. And this is centered. And now I want to solve this. So, um, one of the first stochastic production planning paper in this setting of Brownian motion and, and optimal stochastic control was done by me. Uh, so you, you want to see this is the, the, the paper that I'm covering is my own paper. And I was able to solve it because it's a linear quadratic problem. And so we're going to give you the solution right now. So the first thing is we take the max, which means we take the derivative of this with respect to P and set it equal to zero. When you set it equal to zero, we get this. Remember, usually we are allowing, so if V, v sub x is negative, we allow negative production. If you don't allow it, then we have to say P star X C is this comma zero and max of those two things. This is what we did in chapter six. Okay. We're not we're not going to do that. So we're just going to say this is it. This is unconstrained problem, and and for that particular problem, once we put the P star, we can put the P in there. You remove the max, and when you do that, we get a second order partial differential equation. It has a V sub T, it has a V sub of X, and it's got V double X. So it's a second order partial differential equation. Not always easy to solve, but in a quadratic setting we can. And so that's what you're gonna do right now. Remember, it's a quadratic setting and, and, and this is quadratic here. If it was an infinite horizon problem, it will be quadratic growth. But if it's not an infinite horizon problem, um, <clears throat> we expect the value function to be quadratic. Okay, because it, it, infinite horizon will be quadratic growth. Finite horizon, the function is probably going to be quadratic growth, although we don't need because condition because we need we have this. So we're going to assume <clears throat> a solution. Okay, so you, that's a remark. So we, 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 because at the end of the production rate, is a partial differential equation. So numerically, we will not consider this. We will not consider this further in this chapter. We did that in chapter two, and then we solved the problem with this max. 
and then that problem was a little bit difficult to solve, but we did, and and that was at the end of the chapter, towards the end of the chapter six. We're going to assume that the value function is a quadratic like this. Notice we need these t's because there's finite time t, so things will depend on time t because as you go further and further, you're closer and closer to big t, and so the t has an effect on, on decision, right? So, so we need to put these guys in there. So it's a quadratic function with, with coefficients that depend on time. This is our guess. But remember, you make a guess, you solve the problem, and there's always a verification theorem that tells you that if you can solve that problem with that growth condition or with that boundary condition, then it is the, it is a proper value function. Okay, so so it, it, it looks like a guess, but it's not a guess if you solve the problem, it's no longer a guess. It looks like a guess because you may have some idea of what kind of solution it would be. So, so it's a guess only in the sense that you guessed it from your knowledge of what the solution might be. But it's not a guess because it is going to turn out to be the right one. It's going to be a different situation when you come to the games. Because with games, you can do the same thing. There's also a verification theorem that says you, if you satisfy this and this, this, then it's a value function. And it satisfies this and this and this. But in games, it is possible that that is not the only value function. That there may be non unique value functions. And that's because there are non-unique equilibria. Notice here, you cannot have a non-unique value function because value function is the value from here to there. It has to be unique. There's no chance of it being not unique. By physical meaning, it has to be unique. So if I can satisfy everything and say it is a value function, then uniqueness comes with it. But in the game, it doesn't come with it. So what do we say? It is one of the equilibria. That's all we can say. If, the, if you don't know, if it's not unique, then there may be another equilibria that you do not know. Maybe many more. Who knows? Who knows? Once we have the V, we take the derivative because we need the terms. We need to put terms in this in this right hand side. So we evaluate V sub t, V sub x, V x x, all of that. And we substitute these. And then we separate the term of x squared, x and a constant term. Constant means multiplied of the constant term in terms of x. So this is x squared, this is x. This multiplied, this will be x to the power zero. x to the power zero is one, okay? Everything part zero is one. But now notice, that this equation has to be zero for any value of x, because x is given. I can change it. I, it's arbitrary. It could have been given something else, right? The five people you ask for initial x, they might give you five different values of x. So this equation has to be zero for every value of x. If it's zero for every of the x, then it means that these coefficients have to be zero. It means that guy has to be zero, that guy has to be zero, that guy has to be zero. That means this has to be zero, this has to be zero, this has to be zero. When these guys are zero, q dot q squared plus one equal to zero, then it is a differential equation that is given by here. Because we set equal to zero, there's a q dot term here, there's a q squared term here, set equal to zero, it becomes q dot equal to one minus q squared. So that that gives you a differential equation, and it's qt equal to zero from the boundary condition that we have. So, we get three differential equations as a as a as a condition of satisfying the values. I'm on the Jacobi-Bellman equation. 
And these three equations are not, easy, not difficult to solve. So we take one by one. The boundary conditions come from our boundary conditions. So, so it's straightforward. You can use a formula in, in an integral encyclopedia or handbook, or you can put this into you know math programs, Maple, ma ma what is, and a different different software that you have Mathematica. You can you can put that there, give you a solution. But that is simple, so we can solve this here. So, you the way I solve it, I mean, there may be other ways to do it. So I, the way I solve it is to bring it this side. So you have q dot divided by one minus q square, and then you take partial fraction. Okay, because this is one minus q times one plus q. You take a partial fraction, you get this. This is same as that, and then. You integrate because this is this is dq divided. So if you, if if you call this dq, then d, this dt on go on this side. And if you integrate, the first term is q dot divided by one minus q. You know, q dot divided by one minus q will be integrated to something like log q, because divided by q will integrate will be a log of q. Okay, so that's what we get. And if there's a log, then on the other side it if you change that, it become e to the power. Okay, so you can call it e to the power log is the same thing. Okay. So if you do all of that, you can integrate that very easily. And <laughs> if you integrate very easily, I get q equal to this, where y equal to this. So I have a complete solution of q. coming from this. That one is linear in R. That's a, that's a, that's the equation in R. And it's a linear equation in R dot or R. And its solution is, so we have a log R dot zero, log R dot zero T, which is, comes from the boundary condition, minus T to the Q tau d tau, and we can put, we already know q tau, this is q, so we know q already. Once you know q already, we can integrate that q from t to t, which is just the integral of a function that is not so complicated. And then you have R equal to this. It's a, you know, many, many differential equations get solved. And so here's this one. The last is empty, which is, which is just one term. The right hand side is all T terms or this constant terms or whatever. Uh, the each R, R, we already know Q, we already know R, we know their function nature, so we just integrate this. So, because there's no M on the right side, and we have boundary condition. So we integrate, we, we don't know how to solve the, the integral in closed form, so we leave it like this. It's easy to, 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 to leave it like this, that's a solution. You can integrate numerically very easily. And the optimal control, is now given by v sub x by two, that comes to the qx plus r divided by two. And we can write that as s plus, remember, yeah, so we can write that as, we, we substitute the value of q and r, and we can write this. And then we substitute everything in this function, which is which is coming from here. Yeah, v sub x is I write too. So v sub x is given by this, 2qx by r, 2qx plus r. So we already know q, we already know r. So we can actually write, sorry, we can write qx plus r divided by two, 
ていうのは九尾に合わせておけないんです。Then the p star t at any time t is p star of i t t i t star, which is the optimal control given induced by optimal control the value of inventory at time t. You get this. Notice this feedback control. You don't know its value at time zero. You will know its value at time t because at time t you will know i t star. You substitute i t star, and it can tell you what the control is. In that sense, the control is stochastic because it, it depends on this random random process i t and a function of a random process itself a random process. So we have a complete solution of this problem, and you can write a picture. For initial value two, t equal to twelve, b equal to twenty, its average value uh, s equal to five, sigma equal to two. We get this function like that, and this is given by some kind of parabola. This is the mean evolution of mean x t, because the Brownian motion fluctuates all like crazy, and so. Mean, no, mean is uh, uh, given by dotted line. You can see that just like kind of there's a turnpike tendency to it. You see there's a turnpike tendency. The control is trying to go to this 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 line which is kind of at zero and then it's hovering around the zero, and then because of the boundary condition, it is it wants to bring back to. Some level because the boundary condition says there's a value of the terminal inventory, so it, it wants to build the terminal inventory. So if it's along in a path, it's like this. If it's inferior in the path, it will be like this. Uh, but then you put discounting, so that's another story. But without discounting, if you're along in a path, it will stay most of the time along this path. Now notice, I draw this, but. If you're along in a path, these spikes have no upper bound. They can go as far up as they want once in a while. So there are there are remarks. Um, <clears throat> Production rate equals the demand rate plus the correction term. So it is a demand rate plus the correction term. That's the that's sort of what is having with the production. And uh, see, it's a demand plus some some correction. Okay, so this is this is coming from twelve point three nine. And since y minus is less than zero, only for t less than for t less than t, it's clear that the low values of x. The optimal production rate is positive, so if I have a low value of x, I will have a positive production. But if I have a very high value of x, the production can be negative. And notice now here, we cannot simply do what we did in chapter two. Chapter two, we said if it was if it was not very high enough to begin with, I don't have to worry about it anymore, because then I will never go back again to that level. Optimal control will never get me there. Here, the Brownian motion, um, of course, if it goes very high, the production will try to kill it. But it is possible that it can go high, and then I have to use negative control. But it may happen very, very rarely. So. That's a simplification that we make, and and that's why we wanted to solve that problem for p bigger than equal to zero. And and then I already told you the story about Ben Susan's visit. It is not in small part that that particular visit in 1980s um, more or less formed the basis of him coming here. When he retired in France, because he knew me, and he asked me if I can find a job for him, and I said, "Okay, I will try." So I found a job for him at UTD, and then so he's here. So connections matter.
Now this is when t equal to infinity, y goes to zero, and so p star t goes to s minus x. That's the, that's the stationary kind of solution for this problem. You just produce s minus x. So if x is if x is smaller than s, if x is bigger than s, then you will have a negative production. But it's this is a, without discounting. So the, po the the policy, any policy, will be optimal in in, in a, some way because the the value of the objective function will always be minus infinity. So we need to do discounting to get us out of that mess. Uh, how are you doing time like? Um, <clears throat> We have, um, well, we can do a little bit of this uh, and then we will take a break. This is what is called the SETI model, okay? And the SETI model has a small history, but now it has a big history. The small history is that I was learning stochastic control in uh, my visit to, um, I, was a, I was a visiting professor at Carnegie Mellon in 1978. And there, some bunch of people were learning in math department, this this kind of stuff. So I, I I audited that and I started applying finance, applying stochastic control to finance problems. And I did a lot of work in finance using that methodology. And of course, the paper in production that you saw. But I I I worked a lot on advertising problems. Um, and I couldn't find any paper in marketing that has this kind of application of stochastic control, zero. So my goal was to find one application, one way or another. And, uh, and of course, I, you know from chapter seven, I did Vidal a Wolf advertising model. So I thought, why not, why not add ETO term, a diffusion term or the Wiener process term, whatever you, the terminology, the many ways you say it, and then just try to solve it. And I couldn't. There, there's no closed form solution of Vidal and Wolf model with the Ito term. So what to do? So I said, okay, I'm gonna change the change the model. And I changed the model in two ways. One, I changed the model by changing, you know, it's Vidal model is R times U times one minus X. I made this square root. And then I add the Ito term. Okay, so I did that, make it stochastic, and I changed that to make it solvable. And then I gave a reason that Vidal will just put one minus X. Why not one minus X to the half? Why not one minus X to 3.6? Why not one minus X to the 0.1? It's an empirical issue. It could be anything, right? So why not half? So I put half. And then a couple of marketing professors, one of them was Deepak Jain. Deepak Jain was a PhD from Frank Bass, who was a professor here. He graduated before I came here. He became a dean at Northwestern University. Then he became a dean at um, a university in uh, INSEAD in, in France. After that, he became a dean in some place in Thailand. And now he's a director of uh, what is called the uh, English, or well, it's an 
it's a it's a it's a business school in shanghai which is connected with europe and they have two directors one director is chinese and one director is non chinese and the non chinese director is deepak jain so um that deepak jain and another person decided to test empirically my model and they found that my model with the square root is at least as good as vidal ebol's model empirically so that was good that was a nice thing to have said but i was i was i wasn't interested not interested i was only interested in the stochastic problem but it was lucky that it is also it's also empirically turned out to be as good as vidal ebol's model okay um <clears throat> just just so before i don't forget deepak called me some some days ago and he said that i'm a director of this place and he wants me to visit that school in shanghai when he's he's there when he's there so we were saying okay nobody can travel right now but when we can travel we'll just back and see see if we can get there to shanghai together at the same time okay the other thing that you needed to do is to make this term ut square but that's that's actually very standard If you look at most of the marketing literature, that is what the diminishing margin, margin, diminishing marginal return to advertising dollars. Sorry. In Vidal and Wolf, I had it linear, but most marketing literature wanted to be quadratic, so that was not a big deal. This was a change. That was a big deal. And then U T bigger than equal to zero. Of course, you don't want advertising to be. So this is advertising effort. This is advertising dollars. So the effort. you have to it costs more and more so if i have a effort of 2 and then i go to effort of 4 the effort of 2 costs 4 dollars effort of 4 costs 16 dollars which means that the effort has a marginal and diminishing return that means the dollar value of the effort has marginal and diminishing return if if the effort cost is convex then the its effect is convex okay and all of that is in chapter 7 so we 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 don't have to so the only change is here and then what happens is with this change um it, well i it was I'll call it a cheating if you want um i needed to solve the problem analytically so that the second order term in the value function goes to zero If the second term goes to zero, then the Hamilton-Jacobi-Wellman equation is the same as the Hamilton-Jacobi deterministic case because that second term disappears. And when does that disappear? When the value function is linear, right? If it's linear, then v x x will go to zero. So if you go back to, if you go back to, why can I go back? If you go back to Hamilton-Jacobi-Wellman equation. right here right here if 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 this goes to zero if the value function is linear then this goes to zero then it is the solution is exactly the same as the deterministic solution which means that the expected value of the stochastic problem is the same as the deterministic one value function so the expected profit which is the value function the stochastic problem is the same as the value function which is the profit in the deterministic problem you only have to put the word expected but otherwise they are the same the control is stochastic but remember we are talking about expected value so the control is stochastic the problem is stochastic stochastic control applies but the value function is linear So I said, well, the reverse engineering. I need to find a linear value function, and that's what I did. Let me. Uh, um, we already have this okay so this is not a problem it's a standard one dimensional linear process and 
all of that we already talked about and you can you can make it bounded or unbounded doesn't really matter right now and this is important but it's 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 coming from mathematics what happens is that in chapter 7 we said that if I'm between 0 and 1 market share, then market share will stay between 0 and 1. We can prove that. In a stochastic differential equation, because of this unbounded nature of the motion, you, you cannot just prove that simply. Because it can hoop go below to 0 because it's got such crazy stuff behavior that it can just go below zero. And once it goes below zero, it can stay below zero for, for quite some time. So there's a theorem in Geekman's score called 1972, which is a book that I happen to have. It's part of the course that was taught at Carnegie Mellon, and they use this as a textbook. That is a theorem that says that if sigma x is strictly bigger than zero between x and zero one, and, and at the boundary it is equal to zero, then it will stay between zero and almost surely. And that's enough for me. So I, I put this condition. I only have to find the sigma. So I only have to find this sigma satisfying that it, it degenerates to zero at sigma equal to z, sigma at x equal to zero, x equal to one, the two boundaries. Well, x times one minus x is one, one such function, right? I can put sigma times x times one minus x. Such function will go to zero at one, go to zero at zero, and it will satisfy the geek funds code. And so I can stay between zero and one. I don't need a state constraint. This is important. I don't need a state constraint. So that's one part. The second part is I can show that the UX is going to be bigger than zero for these things, which is which is easy to see when you solve the problem because I have a, a specific problem. I have a I know the form of UX, and I, if I know the form of UX, I can guarantee that. Okay, so that is another thing. So there's a couple of technical remarks here, which are which are which are offloaded to some math math books. Uh, because their proofs may be something that are complicated uh, or more sophisticated. We don't worry about it. We just use the theorems. So I finally have an equation. And u star x is a derivative of that with respect to u is given by this. And you can see at x equal to 1, it is 0. But at x equal to 0, it is strictly bigger than 1. Okay, so that's basically what you need, and you see here, you see here, it is, it's, it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a closed interval on this side. So we're only saying, but even that's coming from, um, um, from keep on score code because you 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 need to multiply. Um, so it's possible to show that kind of satisfying this, and this. The Ito equation will have a solution such that this, so so, several conditions that allow you to do that, and and I th that is completely satisfied. In fact, it is even satisfied at one. It's at no one. At one is exactly equal to zero. So, and then I say, okay, linear value function. So I decide that the value function is linear. I substitute the value just like I did in a quadratic problem, and you find the coefficients. And this is your value function. You see it's linear, lambda bar x plus a constant. A, so I, what I do is I say, let the value function be ax plus b. Then I substitute, I, I, there are two terms, I equate them to zero each, just like I did in the production planning, just the model previously to that. And then I can find A and a B. So what we're doing in all these three applications, the next one too, we are not assuming the knowledge of solution of partial differential equations. Secondly, even if you knew partial differential equation theory, in most cases, they will not be so easy to solve. 
And in cases that are easy to solve, you go by guessing their solution and then finding the coefficients. And I already told you, if you can find the coefficient and the value function, then we have a theorem that says that is a value function. I mean, if you find a solution to that equation, then we have a theorem that says you have a value function. That means because it solves the problem and value function has to be unique. So there's no other solution. Okay, so 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 a a becomes lambda bar and a b becomes this quantity, and this quantity is all this. So it is it, it is it, uh, it, these are just parameters, they're constants, and so it, it looks horrible, but it is it is just a x plus b. And you can sort of see that u star x is now given by this because I already know. The value function, I know it's derivative, v sub x is lambda bar, then v sub x is part of the object, it's v sub x here, so I substitute v sub x there and I get the solution for u star x. That's a feedback control. It's clear that if I have an upper bound, then, then um, u star x t will be um, bigger than u bar if this is x t less than x bar, it be equal to u bar if x t equal to x bar. If it's less than u bar, it will be x t equal to x bar, and 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 uh, and, and and where x bar is this and u bar is this. Twelve point four, twenty point four four, which is this. Okay, so this condition is satisfied, and so we know that the solution is not going to go outside zero and one. Now, optimal market trajectory, notice that even though the value function is the same as the value function of the deterministic problem, that means if I were to remove this, that means if I were to remove this term, I can still solve the problem and its value function is exactly what I just got. But that value function is a profit this value function is expected value of that profit. Why it is expected value? Because process X is still going to be a diffusion process. It's still going to be stochastic. Oh, the term, if, if this is this is Ito equation, then that stochastic process called XT is also called diffusion process. Okay, so stochastic process, diffu diffusion process is a special case. So it's a, it's a but remember the XT is stochastic because this is stochastic. So that is stochastic because that is stochastic. Then the control is also a stochastic process because control is XT here. So when you put X star T, see that this is U star of XT, XT is stochastic, so U star will be stochastic. So the control will still go like this and the state will still go like this. But its expected value is the same as expected value if there were no Brownian motion. Why am I talking like this uh, on this one? Because after Deepak Jain wrote this paper, at least this became respectable model. And then the group here and another group of people in Vienna and another group of people in, in British Columbia, people were working using my model and extending it to different kinds of problems. And its tractability continues to give dividends. And then we did Nash equilibrium, then we did Steckelberg equilibrium, which was one of my postdoc was here, worked on that, and that paper came out in Palm. And recently I'm working with a math group in Hong Kong and who are basically full-time working on SETI model, and we have like three or four papers. One of them is under conditional acceptance at, at Palm. Uh, this is a three echelon model. At, did, did Kushali give you that paper? Kushali, did you send that? No, okay, she's, she, she's not out right now, maybe come later. So that yeah, one. Yes, Professor, I did send the paper. I emailed it after class okay. last week. So that, that paper is uh, just, 
that paper just got reviewed. The second round and the second round, the DE says is conditional acceptance, and 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 there's one one kind of revision in it. I hope that I thought I hope that that revision is not difficult to do. I, I sent it to the Hong Kong people, and the, those are the three math guys who are working on that. And another one generalizes the SETI model to as far as it's remain tractable. The boundary of what you can do to it. That means instead of square root, can you do something else? Can you do gamma? And then what you have to do the otherwise. And that is under currently under under first round at operations research. I think I sent them the one with the Fawad because that's the one you requested. I'll go ahead and send them the other two with the SETI model. No, no, one is enough. The one that okay. you sent with the palm, right? Yeah, yeah, I've sent the one with Fawad and the other guy from Israel. Oh, no. no, no. Epidemic send, control one. Send, send the one said. with Philip, the three echelon. Yes, I'll send them that after class. That's fine. So what I'm trying to say is that this model has continued to give a lot of different extensions, and because of that one tractability, the tractability is a game in town, right? If you don't have tractable, then it's difficult to solve the problems, and it's difficult to publish uh, in many cases. So, so a lot of stuff going on, and we are still working on other extensions of SETI model. So it's not finished yet. Uh, this is now 83, 17, 21, 38 years from the origination of the model. Work is still going on. And there are maybe 30, 40 papers already extending this. And um, Ashutosh Prasad and I, I mean, as Prasad left now to go to Davis, we are supposed to write a book but he's gone, so I'm doing it with one of my former PhD student, Chutani, who's a professor in Notre Dame. No, not Notre Dame, he's a professor in, uh, in, in England. Um, and, and we are writing one day a book collecting models based on 1983 SETI model, and, and the title of the book will be something like Dynamic Marketing or something like that. So it will... It will be a book having many of these models. Um, so, so anyway, so that's 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 the good time to take a break. Uh, when we go, when we come back, we're gonna work at the optimal consumption investment problem, which is the consumption problem that we have been working on since since the chapter one. Chapter one, we had an example, and then we continue to have that example. We extended that example. Um, we created um, um, but we did not do stochastic part of it. There was a problem with rich rentier who could who could who could who could consume the who can consume the wealth, but can also invest a little bit in a, in a, in a, in a bond market. Uh, we went all the way, but now the stock market. So now the rich rentier is a rich investor. Okay, so, so he's become rich investor. So they, we have three riches here. One is a rich guy who just consume, rich consumer. And then, then the rich rentier who is gonna do the, the whatever that did, and now the rich investor. So that problem continues. And it is this particular problem that basically took off in finance. Because stochastic control applied to this problem was actually a major breakthrough in finance. One of the guy won the Nobel Prize uh, doing this kind of stuff, not exactly the particular problem with consumption investment, but close to it. Okay, so at that time, we should take a break and let's do 10 minutes and I